All right, so last time we talked about why Mendel's laws are true based on how the cell divides in making eggs and sperm. And so we went through the two, uh, two rounds of meiosis, meiosis one, meiosis two, talked about how chromosomes segregated, crossing over. Um, I want to talk about now how this actually happens in eggs or in sperm production. Okay, so last time we talked about meiosis and we just were very generic. We just said, well, chromosomes divide this way and we weren't specific about types of cells that we were making. So I wanna just go into spermatogenesis first and then we'll contrast that with how eggs are made in uh, oogenesis. So here is spermatogenesis. Um, sorry the font is small, but I'll talk you through these. Um, spermatogenesis starts with cells that have been set aside in order to become the sperm cells. Um, and actually, we should just call them germ cells at this point. Uh, germ cells are just cells that are set aside to become either eggs or sperm. Um, actually, germ cells are generic. A germ cell doesn't know whether it's supposed to become egg or it's supposed to become sperm until it actually gets signals from the gonadal tissue. Okay? So when an organism is developing, early in development, it'll set apart some cells and it'll say, these ones I'm going to use to make my reproductive material. Okay. The rest of everything is going to start going, undergoing mitosis and rapidly dividing and making the tissues of your body, you know, making your brain and your skin and your organs, making your gonads, right, the testes and the ovaries. Testes and ovaries, those cells come from um, the rest of the cells of your body. Right? Germ cells are the ones that actually are going to be making eggs and sperm. So there's actually two different cell types in your gonads. There's the gonadal tissue itself and then there's the germ cells that migrate into that depending on where they migrate into, tells those germ cells whether they should become egg or whether they should become sperm. And you can actually do interesting experiments where you can transplant you know, uh, germ cells from a male and put them into a developing female, and that female will take those germ cells and will make them into eggs, even though originally they were male from a male. So those are weird experiments you can do, but just so you know that the, the germ cells are as, as a generic term, they don't start becoming spermatogonia or oogonia until they've migrated into an actual gonad. All right. So we'll talk about germ cells that have migrated into a male gonad, a, a, a testes. Uh, we call these guys spermatogonia. These are two N cells. They've got two copies of every chromosome. And germ cells are one of the few cell types in your body that have turned on telomerase. So every time a, a spermatogonia undergoes cell division, it elongates its, uh, uh, its telomeres. Okay, so these are like immortalized cells. These cells basically don't know how old they are because every time they undergo cell division, they extend the telomeres and keep their length. Okay? So these are perpetually uh, undergoing cell division, especially in male populations. Male oogonia continue to divide throughout the male's entire life, lifespan. So males can typically make sperm right up until the point of when they're dying. Um, now, sometimes the sp they're not as good of germ cells anymore because they've, uh, the gonadal tissue isn't doing things as well and kind of bodily degeneration. But males actually produce sperm up until the day they die. Do you have a question, Will? Uh, it's not true with, with, uh, with eggs, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So these spermatogonia, when they divide, they undergo what's called an asymmetric cell division. Okay? So these are the set-aside cells. When they reproduce, they replenish themselves. So here is a spermatogonia. It's going to divide, and it produces two cells. One of them remains a germ cell. It remains a spermatogonia, lives to divide another day. Okay? The other one is called a primary spermatocyte. That cell is destined to go and divide and become sperm. But it's still a 2N cell. This is actually a mitotic division, mitosis, normal cell division. It's the primary spermatocyte, this guy, that is going to be destined now to go on for the two rounds of meiotic division, making of sperm in this case. Okay. So that first division is mitosis, but it's an asymmetric mitosis, meaning it produces two different distinct types of cells. Right? This is kind of like uh, stem cells. Right? This spermatogonia 
remains its kind of precursor generic state. Okay, so it's, you always have those hanging around, ready to do this division again. The primary spermatocyte, in the context of the, um, the testes, is going to undergo the first meiotic division. So it's going to separate homologous chromosomes. Then it's going to go through the second round of meiotic division and separate the now rearranged sister chromatids. So I'm still going to call them sister chromatids because they're stuck together. But they've recombined now, so they're reshuffled. They're not identical anymore. In the second round, it's going to separate all of those. And so if you've gone through two rounds of division, right, the first meiotic division gave you two cells. Each one of those goes through the second round of meiotic division. And so in males, you make four what are called spermatids. And these are all now just got one copy of every chromosome. So they are 1n. Their ploidy number n is 1. So for every time a primary spermatocyte goes through meiosis, you make four spermatids. And then those th go through a maturation process and actually become sperm. This is all happening in the context of male gonad cells. Okay. Um, so here is the um, spermatogonia. It would undergo my uh, mitosis asymmetric mitosis, and this would be the primary spermatocyte. And this cell is always completely surrounded by the gonadal tissue. Okay? So this is the germ cells. And around here, this huge cell is called a serotoli cell. And it's the serotoli cell that's giving it male hormones. This is what makes the gonadal tissue male. And so it's the serotoli cell um, stimulates the concentration of testosterone, supplies the developing sperm. Basically, it's guiding this generic germ cell to divide in the sperm way. Okay? It's the context of the gonads. Now, I'm not going to go into much of serotoli cells and, and the other um, male follicle cells, but I just want you to know the reason these are developing the sperm is because they're surrounded and they're interacting with male gonadal tissue, you know, testosterone and and the other male hormones that are making this go sp the sperm direction. Yeah. Uh, so consequently, then, if they were surrounded by female tissues, yeah. they would be? They would undergo oogenesis. Okay. Yeah. So if you took that primary spermatogonia and transplanted it into a female ovary, oh, it would just divide as if it was supposed to be an egg. <coughs> right? So that guy's generic. He doesn't know what to do. It's the serotoli cell and the other male gonadotitial that tells it to divide in the sperm way. That would be here in the first meiotic division um, when the homologous chromosomes line up in pro-metaphase and in, in the late, uh, yeah, the, late uh, the early portions of metaphase. So in, in late interphase, early metaphase, that's where the recombin recombining is going on. By the time you've divided to these two cells, no more recombination. You're just separating the, the reshuffled chromosomes. So each one of those sperm cells has only one chromosome, but it's a unique reshuffling of each of those chromosomes. Okay. So there's no two sperm, no two eggs that are genetically identical. They're all unique reshufflings. Okay. So that's the basics of spermatogenesis, and I'm illustrating it here on top for comparative reasons because we're going to now contrast it with making eggs, oogenesis. So you start out with a, a germ cell. If a germ cell is in female gonadal tissue, we call it the oocyte. So this was the spermatocyte if, it, if the germ cell was in male tissue, oocyte if it's in female ovary tissue. Um, same mechanism is going to happen in the first round of meiosis. Align homologous chromosomes, recombined, separate the homologous chromosomes, and what's unique here, though, so in sperm, 
the cell division at that first meiosis is symmetrical in terms of it's going to cut the cell right down in the middle. The two cells are of identical size. In the female, in the, in the ovary, that first division is asymmetric. So one of the cells is going to get the bulk of the cytoplasm and the organelles and the proteins and everything. The other one is going to be just basically just a chromosomes and a tiny bit of cytoplasm. It's going to be a very tiny little cell that's just basically stuffed full of the chromosomes. We call this a polar body. It's not going to go on and become an egg. When you make eggs, you take that primary oocyte, and even though you're going to basically go through both rounds of meiosis and create four unique combinations of chromosomes, only one of them is going to survive to actually become the egg. So this brings up the first theme of the differences between eggs and sperm. Sperm are cheap, eggs are expensive, right? Because if you're doing the comparison of the math, right, you only get one egg for every four sperm, right? Now, there's more reasons why eggs are expensive, too. And we'll get to those a little bit later. But that first cell division, right, only one of the, only one of the um, daughter cells is going to get the cytoplasm. Then when you go through the second round of meiosis and actually separate these recombined sister chromatids, again, the, the, the division is going to be asymmetrical. Now, sometimes that tiny little cell will go through the second round of meiosis. Sometimes it won't, depending on the species. Uh, but we'll just, in this case, we'll say it does. So it's going to make two tiny little cells here. And then when this guy divides, when that big cell goes under cell division, it's also an asymmetric division. So only one of those cells is going to inherit most of the cytoplasm. The other one that's from that is going to be a third polar body. Okay. So sometimes if you're watching oogenesis in, in, a, in an organism, you might see one polar body made, and then you might only see a second polar body. Some of the animals actually, that, polar, that first polar body actually splits and becomes two. So sometimes you'll see two polar bodies. Sometimes you'll see three. It's just depending on the, the animal you're looking at. But the main point is, you're only going to get one egg. Okay. Now, when we went through spermatogonia, or spermatogenesis, we made really, really tiny cells that were sperm. Basically, a sperm cell is, um, is a couple of vesicles, a nuclei, and just very little cytoplasm. There's a lot of mitochondria in there, because it's going to have to swim, but it's a really stripped down cell not doing much metabolism. It's just packed full of mitochondria and nuclei, and that's about it, really small cells. In eggs, the exact opposite is different. The egg, as it matures, the one egg cell that you're actually producing gets lots and lots of cytoplasm. And that cytoplasm and all those organelles get stuffed in it from the surrounding gonadal tissue in the ovary. So here is the maturation of, a, of an egg. Um, Already here, so let's see, um, here's a growing, what we call the primary follicle. Uh, a follicle is just the egg and all of the surrounding um, female gonadal tissue that's around it. Okay? So here, you can already see, this is a huge cell. See that big white thing in there? That's the egg cell. It's tremendously large compared to all of the tiny little cells. So if you, here's a growing primary follicle, here's a getting a little bit bigger, and mostly it's getting bigger because all these follicle cells around it are multiplying. So the cell, the egg cell itself is getting big, but then it's producing lots of um, follicle cells around it and lots of fluid-filled space around it. So this whole thing is called the follicle. That guy, the dark one here is the egg. The light one here is the egg. Here is a mature follicle. This is a follicle that's almost ready for the female to release it and let it you know, have the potential to be fertilized. Uh, you can't even see the cells of the follicles. Right? Those follicle cells are really tiny little cells. At this magnification, you can't even see their cytoplasm. But look at how enormous the egg is. Ridiculously large cell. Okay? This is also why eggs are expensive. You're putting lots and lots of stuff in them. <laughs> Whereas sperm, you're basically just stripping them down to almost nothing but just a nuclei. The egg, you're packing all kinds of nutrients, all kinds of cytoplasm, all kinds of organelles. Everything that basically the developing organism needs initially has to be packed into the egg. So eggs are expensive. Uh, oogonia, 
the germ cells that actually migrate into the, uh, into the ovary. And this is, these are numbers for humans. Six to seven million of these set-aside germ cells actually migrate into the gonadal tissue. So you've got millions of the, of the cells that have the potential for becoming eggs. Only two million of those are still surviving at birth. A lot of them have undergone apoptosis uh, or quit, quit dividing. So only two million when a, when a female is born, female <laughs> person is born. You only have about 400,000 of them by the time that that female reaches puberty. So, you know, 12, 13 years old, uh, the body has already pared those down and you only have about 400,000 of them. Only about 400 of them are actually going to go through the process of undergoing um, the two rounds of meiosis and actually becoming a mature follicle that actually gets released. So males are producing millions of sperm throughout their lifespan. Uh, a female is only producing about 400 mature eggs that will be released. So those are precious. Right? Questions about the difference between spermatogenesis and oogenesis? Yeah. Um, I've heard interesting things about the tail. Does the tail serve a purpose other than the locomotion? The tail of sperm? Yeah. Uh, as far as I know, it's just locomotion. I mean, there are proteins expressed on it, so maybe there's some type of, you know, interaction between the proteins of, that are expressed on the sperm membrane and the proteins that are in the female reproductive tract. So maybe there's some recognition going on there. Um, but usually that's happening in this, the cell membrane around the head of the, of the sperm. But, I mean, very likely there could be some other function. I just don't know. What, what have you heard? Uh, well, actually, it was kind of a question that I've always wondered. Oh, okay. I've, I've heard, you know, it's the tail has no use, and I was wondering if there was more to it than that. Yeah, well, I mean, the tail has use for locomotion. Right. But and it's interesting. Um, the flagellum in the, in the sperm is much different than the flagellum that you find like in a, a bacteria. A bacterial flagellum, all it is is proteins that are making up that whip-like tail. Uh -huh. In sperm, the flagellum is actually completely surrounded by the cell membrane. So that's why I say there's lots of proteins that are expressed in the cell membrane on that. And so that you know, could have you know, recognition between species, you know, making sure that a sperm is actually fertilized by this, the right species. Uh, this is more common uh, in externally fertilized organisms. So like, you know, for instance, a sea squirt. Uh, if you have a sea squirt in the ocean, it's just releasing eggs and sperm right out into the ocean, open water. And so eggs and sperm have to be particular about finding their appropriate species. So there's lots of protein-protein recognitions to make sure that a sea squirt sperm fertilizes a sea squirt egg and not a sea urchin sperm fertilizing a sea squirt, right? So there's lots of cell-cell recognition that has to go on there. That's not so much true in organisms that do internal fertilization, because usually it's like animal behavior that determines whether two animals actually, you know, sperm and egg come in contact with each other. So it's actually interesting, the, the I don't know, um, the checkpoints are kind of lower. And so you can actually get almost any mammal's sperm to fertilize almost any other mammal's eggs. So human sperm will fertilize mouse eggs. Mouse sperm will fertilize human eggs. You can do these weird interactions. The cells don't have very much specificity in terms of egg and sperm recognizing each other. The specificity comes from animal's behavior, you know, because in the wild, those two are never going to mate, right? But if you actually extract the eggs and sperm, and kind of trick them into thinking that they're in the reproductive tract of a female, uh, you can get them to fertilize. And this is often um, tests for fertility are done this way. So you'll take male sperm and tr attempt to fertilize uh, mouse eggs with it to see if the male sperm are functioning properly. Um, the, the sperm will fuse, and we're getting to fertilization, this is my next point anyway, but the, the sperm and the egg will fuse. Uh, the pronuclei will, will start to come together usually the cell will recognize there's different numbers and sizes of chromosomes here, and so you won't even enter into the first mitosis. Um, so that's a checkpoint, right? When a cell's actually trying to divide and align its chromosomes, it'll recognize, I've got two sets of chromosomes that don't make sense, and the cell will undergo apoptosis or stop. Only very closely related species will you actually have a successful my meiosis. So you can get ligers and tions and, you know, 
whales and dolphins can crossbreed and stuff. Um, but mouse and human fertilized eggs will never develop into anything. So, so good thing, right? We'll do Victoria and they can come back. What's that? Monkey and human? I don't know if it's ever done. Strange people say they've done it and claim that they've raised organisms that are a half man, half chimp. Uh, I doubt. I doubt it. Uh, we do have different numbers of chromosomes, and that usually, usually knocks it out right there. Um, there, was, there was this, like, there was a chimp called Oliver, Oliver the Human Z. It was like in the, the 20s or something. They, they took a chimp and they shaved him so that he didn't have any of his facial hair, and then like taught him how to smoke a cigar and dressed him up in men's clothes. And they claimed that he was the, you know, cross between a human and a, and a chimp, the Human Z. Um, I don't believe that that was true. Uh, so, some people think that Saskatchewan or, or Bigfoot is a is a hybridization between a a human and some other, because hybrids tend to be bigger, right? So like if you have a, lion, uh, uh, a liger or a tyon, uh, that animal is usually bigger than either a lion or a tiger was. That's just kind of the result of having extra chromosomes around. So there's some, some talk that Bigfoot is actually a hybrid between two, and that's why it's so big. Uh, you know, funny stories, but. Um, I have a question regarding the eggs in the polar Yeah. Well, I'm not sure ex exactly which one is chosen to become the big one, uh -huh. but when they set up, so like in the first cell division, so he's asking about which cell becomes the polar body. Mm -hmm. uh, when the spindle gets set up here, it sets the spindle up on one side of the cell because where the spindle gets set up, if you set up the spindle so that the middle of the spindle is right in the middle of the cell, the cell will divide right where the middle of the spindle is. If you move that spindle off to one side of the cell, the, the cell will divide wherever the middle of the spindle was. So if you just put the spindle way close to one side of the membrane, the cell that buds off is gonna be small. Now, how the cytoskeleton determines which side it should put the spindle on, I'm not sure. There might be mechanisms, and there probably are embedded proteins in there. And during the cell's develop, or during you know this oocyte's development, probably the cytoskeleton is already setting up where that spindle is going to be set. But I don't know the the cellular detail of how that works. I, it's not random. Is is the answer to the question? Uh, how it's not random, I don't know the mechanism. So. So same with the second division. When this one sets up its spindle. This is a, a bad illustration because it, it looks like the middle of the spindle's there, but really the spindle is shifted to one side, and so it makes a really tiny little cell, and then a bigger. So. And technically, they can pick a whole body to be the egg, right? No, I mean, once it's a tiny little polar body, that's not going to become an egg. The egg's going to be the one that has all the cytoplasm and all the embedded proteins and stuff. So, so all the polar bodies are going to die? Yeah, they basically just. Um, I, I think they hang around and they just get reabsorbed. I don't know if it's by macrophages or what, or if the cells are just lost at ovulation, but they're, they're not going to go on to do anything else. So, yeah. I'm not sure if they're actually broken down or if they just hang around and don't do anything anymore. So, Will, did you have a question? Are you about uh, fertilization specifically with the number of eggs? Is that, is that usually the factor when we talk about infertility, or is it uh, more about the environment? I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots of reasons for infertility. It, it could be just the male's not making enough sperm, and there's nothing actually wrong with the sperm. We just need to get more of them. Sometimes the sperm is immodal, and it's not actually making its way through the female tract. So then you can do IVF and just get a sperm interacting. Sometimes the sperm's actually incapable of fertilizing the egg, and then you can take sperm and actually inject it inside eggs. Um, but then sometimes there's a whole host of female problems of whether the eggs are actually capable of being fertilized or whether she's actually ovulating them. So, I mean, there's a, a spectrum of, of differences on both the male and female side. So. If the count was an issue at all. If the sperm count was an issue? The female egg count. Because you egg count. so small. Yeah. That, is that ever, is that ever, I mean. Yeah. Well, I mean, later in life, yeah, that could be an issue. And in menopause, I mean, the, the woman's ovaries actually shut down, and they just stop producing mature eggs. So at menopause, you stop doing that entirely. 
So you can have early onset menopause and that would be a problem. There's, there's some ability to go in and artificially, if the problem is the female's not maturing these primary follicles, not maturing them to the point where they can be ovulated, uh, you can put females on uh, hormone therapy and just like oversaturate them with follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, these ones that actually are secreted from the brain that tell the ovaries to actually start doing this. So you can like put, uh, put people on fertility drugs, that's what we're doing. Uh, if a female's having a hard time, if it's, the, if it's a female issue and not producing eggs, you put them on a bunch of hormones and hopefully they'll start ovulating. Uh, if that's not working, you put them on a bunch of hormones and you can actually go in and surgically go in and remove those eggs. That's what you have to do if you're going to do in vitro fertilization. You're going to have to surgically remove eggs. So you put women on really high levels of, of hormones, make them mature a bunch of these follicles, go in and actually remove them, put them in a petri dish, and, and do fertilization in the dish. So, yeah. Mark? I heard about when, like, sperm are going to, like, go to fertilize, they all work together to let, like, one. That's what I heard. The sperm are working together? I've always heard it described as more of a competition between I, sperm. I heard that too, but yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, they very well may be. I, I don't know. I mean, sperm actually do sense when they're getting close to the egg, and so they'll get more active the closer they are to the egg. And so then maybe other sperm are feeding back on like, oh, that one's getting more active. Maybe he's sensing an egg. And so maybe there's co some cooperation there. I've not seen this, so I don't know. But I, I can imagine maybe it is true. I don't know. So Do your paper on it. That might be fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too late to change topics. But <laughs> yeah. Is it true that the, the female like ones will end up like going faster but not quicker, and the guys go slower? Yeah. Is the question is, do sperm containing an X chromosome that would yeah. that would make a female uh, individual or sperm containing a Y chromosome make a male? Is there any difference between those? Um, I've read things that say yes, and I, but I'm skeptical of them. So, yeah, I mean, I've read some things that say if a female has had a female child, then that changes the dynamics of the things that are, are, are in her reproductive tract, and that will sometimes select then for another female. So I've heard things that say if you've had a female first, you're more likely to have a female child after that because somehow the female's just, you know, deciding between a male and a female sperm. I really just don't know. Um, it seems like in terms of just statistics, it's about 50-50 male and female. <laughs> uh, but I haven't looked at the data. My, my sample set is small. I've got three girls. <laughs> that theory holds true for my data set, but that's a very small sample, right? So I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to skip gamete fusion if you want to take Developmental biology, we'll talk about that. But we need to start talking about sex linkage and sex determination. So we've got the idea of making eggs, making sperm, the two of them coming together. And I want to talk about now traits that tend to go with either being male or female. And also, if we get time, we'll start talking about how do you actually become male or female uh, in terms of what is the mechanism to tell a, a developing embryo to develop like a female or develop like a male. So we'll talk about sex linkage first. That's traits that tend to go to one sex or the other. Sex determination is how do you actually become male or female. Most species have what we call sexual dimorphism. That is, the male and the female actually look different. Right? Their form is different than each other. So this is true in, in, uh, in humans, right? Males have a tendency to have you know, more muscle, less body fat, you know, broader shoulders, secondary sex characteristics like facial hair and deep voices, and then obviously the difference between external genitalia. Right? Um, that's actually fairly subtle. Humans have fairly subtle sexual dimorphism. Right? We're about the same size. You kind of have the same kind of features. Um, birds have a lot of sexual dimorphisms, usually in their coloration. Right? So I put a peacock up here. Here's a peahen. You know, she's fairly subtle in her coloration. She's got a nice iridescent green neck here. This one has a green neck. But her, her wing feathers are pretty brown and, and, and drab looking. 
And then the male has this, you know, obviously huge ornamental um, feather patterns and very beautiful. Um, so birds, you can almost always tell the male and female from each other just by coloration. Uh, here is the anglerfish. This is one of those really deep fish that have that little angling um, appendage that kind of hangs off their head, like in Finding Nemo, right? And it sometimes it's iridescent or something. And the idea is it attracts fish by this little, little dangling uh, light and then chomps on them, right? Um, the one that actually makes that little angling thing, this is actually the female. Um, and huge teeth, yeah, these are really ugly, <laughs> treacherous things. Uh, they're even uglier here than they are in Finding Nemo. The one in Finding Nemo looks kind of cool, but this is just kind of disgusting. Um, this, this guy right here, that is the male. Much, much smaller. And the, the male's job is to find a female. If he finds a female that he can, that he can um, actually reproduce with, he like bites onto her <laughs> and permanently attaches himself to the female for the rest of his life. Right? <laughs> E so much so that he doesn't even feed anymore. The bloodstream of the male and the female actually fuse, and so he never eats. He just like gets supplied with nutritious blood from the female. Um, it's like the, the huge extreme of sexual dimorphism, right? He like gives up his life entirely just to reproduce with the female, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pitiful. <laughs> Uh, so there's, there's really interesting sexual dimorphisms. Um, in flies, the dimorphism, as you know, is pretty subtle, right? Uh, even more subtle than, than humans, right? Uh, you could just, external genitalia, the sex combs, not much different between the male and female. But under the microscope, you can discern them pretty easy, right? Um, Thomas Hunt Morgan is the first guy who actually um, started taking modern chromosomal theory because he was at the point in, in history where we actually had microscopes good enough to look at chromosomes. And he could actually see the chromosomes different sizes under the microscope. Uh, and he could see that male and female flies inherited different sets of chromosomes, okay? So we'd already known about linkage, the fact that certain traits tend to go with each other. You know, Bateson and Punnett were doing this in you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s, and saw that certain traits in different organisms went together, right? Thomas Hunt Morgan actually said, the reason they're linked, the reason they go together, is because those two traits are coded for on certain chromosomes. And the way he, he discovered and way he verified this was by looking at the different chromosomes in the different flies, okay? So he saw, and people already seen, right, certain traits are disproportionately linked together. He was looking for traits that were linked to the sex, okay? So one of the spontaneous mutations that Thomas, uh, that Morgan was uh, cultivating in his lab were these white-eyed flies. And so typically a, a normal wild-type fly has these bright red eyes, and we'll actually look at these in lab today. I'm growing some white flies, so you can look at some this week. Uh, some of them, this spontaneous mutation made them so that they couldn't make any pigment in their eyes, and so they have white eyes. Disproportionately, males show the white-eyed phenotype. Fewer females show it. Most of the time, it shows up in only in males. So this is called sex linkage, where a trait or a sex-linked mutation, a trait is always going with, or more often going with one of the male or female sexes. Now, this is right about where chromosomal theory was coming in, so we were looking at chromosomes. And so Morgan said, he figured out that the actual gene that's causing the white-eyed phenotype is located on one of the sex chromosomes, one of the chromosomes that's given only to male or female. Now, he also postulated that these chromosomes can cross over, and so sometimes you can see differences. They don't always go with males. They sometimes do go with females. But we'll talk about crossing over uh, when we talk about linkage later. So. Here is the reason why this is true. Flies have X and Y chromosomes, just like you have X and Y chromosomes. Uh, the difference is the Y chromosomes are actually much longer. So in humans, the, the Y chromosome is very short. In flies, the Y chromosome is very long. So here is a male individual. 
the male is called heterogametic. Uh, heterogametic means you have two different kinds of chromosomes. Right? So in humans, the male is heterogametic because we have an X and we have a Y. In flies, the male is heterogametic because when he has a Y, well, because males have Ys, let's say it that way. Okay. The female is homogametic because she has two Xs, right? She's got two of the same chromosome, so she is homogametic. All right, so a normal wild type copy of this gene that codes for having pigment in your eyes lies on the X chromosome. So here is a strain of pure breeding red eyed individuals. This is one from a, a female from that pure breeding red eyes. So she's got two X chromosomes, and on each of the chromosomes she has plus version of that gene. Now so here's something unique to flies. Fly genes are always named after the mutant phenotype. Okay? So because a mutation in this gene causes white eyes, we've named the gene white. That's confusing because a wild type copy of the white gene gives red eyes. <laughs> so the gene is named after the mutation. So a good copy of the white gene gives red eyes. A mutant copy of the white gene gives white eyes. Get used to it. Flies are always backwards like this. All right. So two good copies of the white gene on two X chromosomes gives you red eyes. The reason males show the, the, the white-eyed phenotype more often is because they only have one X chromosome. Right? So here they're having a mutant copy, and this is just W. Right? So in fly nomenclature, a plus means wild type. If there is no plus, it means it's a mutant allele. Okay? So W is the mutant version of this gene, giving this male white eyes. We would say that this guy is now hemizygous. So he is heterogametic. He's got two different chromosomes. For this trait, he is hemizygous because he only gets to have one copy of each allele. Right? He doesn't have the advantage of having a second chromosome that could have a wild type copy on that. Right? So he is hemizygous. He only gets one allele. So if he inherits uh, a mutant copy on the X chromosome, he's got nothing else to make up for it because he's got a, a Y chromosome, he's going to have white eyes. So this is what, uh, what Morgan postulated. Uh, when we actually get to linkage, I'll show you the actual experiment he did. It's a pretty clever experiment. Uh, but this is, I want you to get the terms heterogametic, homogametic, and hemizygous. Right. So now if we do the crosses, so here's a white-eyed male. These are the two gametes he could give. If I cross it with a wild-type female, she can only give the good copy. So the Punnett square is really easy to do the mating between these guys. Right? Here's the female. She's only giving one good copy on her X chromosome. It's the male that determines whether it's male and if it's male, whether it's got white eyes or not. Right? So he is giving a Y chromosome, and that means the trait is determined by the X. This is called X linkage, X linked trait, because what's on the, on the chromosome from the, the X is what's going to determine the phenotype. Right? So all of the offspring from this cross are going to have red eyes. The males are going to have red eyes, because they've only got red eyed version there. The females are going to be heterozygous. The female is homogametic, two Xs, but heterozygous, two different alleles. Right. So she's going to be red because the, the red gene is dominant. Now, if you take these two individuals and cross them, this is when you start seeing males more often getting um, the, uh, the white-eyed phenotype. Okay. Because think about the, the, the gametes that these two individuals can have. So these two are represented up here. So here, this male either gives a Y, determining male type, or gives a red-eyed X. 
the female can either give a red-eyed X or a white X. If you do the cross, do the Punnett square between them, male is determined by inheriting the Y from the, uh, the father. So I've got two males here. If it inherits an X from the father, it's going to be red-eyed. Right? So all the females are always going to have red-eyed, good, uh, functional gene, right? wild-type gene. So no matter what it gets from the mother, whether it gets a, a good uh, wild-type copy, it's going to be red. If it gets a mutant copy from the mom, still going to be red because it gets to be heterozygous, and that, that good copy can, st can still make you red eyes. The males, however, have 50-50 chance. Right? If they inherit a good copy from mom, then they'll be red. If they inherit the mutant copy from mom, they're going to be white. So males more often show the white-eyed phenotype. So this is sex linkage, specifically X chromosome linkage. Questions on this? Yeah. Um, in X linkage, it's always the X chromosome that's going to determine the phenotype. Okay. This is holding true because it's a recessive trait, right? So 50-50 chance for the male to be white-eyed because he either gets a good copy or a recessive copy. The females are always going to be red because even if they inherit a white, it's recessive. You could have X linked dominant. And then you're going to show a different phenotype here, right? Or a different ratios. The females will show things more often than when it's a recessive. So what this is is recessive X-linked. So I don't know if that answers your question, but this is only one mode of X inheritance. Most mutations we think about are, are recessive. Uh, we'll talk about dominance later. There are human sex-linked traits, X-linked traits. Uh, the classic example is hemophilia. So this is an inheritance uh, or a pedigree from the, um, the royal family in England. So this is Queen Victoria. Here she is, Queen Victoria, married to Albert. She, has, she is homogametic. She's got two Xs. But on one of her Xs, she carries a recessive allele of the gene that causes hemophilia, failure to clot your blood. So she doesn't show any symptoms because she's got one good copy on one of her X chromosomes, but she's got the mutant copy on the other. Now what's going to happen then is, so the, the purple inside the blue, that's indicating she's a heterozygote, she's a carrier. And what happens is males are going to inherit their Y chromosome from their father. And so it's going to be a 50-50 chance. If your mom's a carrier, it's a 50 chance you're going to be a hemophiliac or you'll be scot-free, right? It's all or none. So this is the inheritance of an X-linked trait. So um, Duke of Leopold, or Leopold, Duke of Albany, uh, was a hemophiliac. Uh, two of his sisters were carriers. And so you can see males are the ones that show the, show the effect, right? If a male gets the recessive copy, doesn't have another X to make up for it, and so males are more typically hemophiliacs than females. It's pretty rare to get uh, a female that actually, uh, a carrier mother um, actually married uh, a hemophiliac male, and then you could actually get it. Or I guess if two hemophiliacs, a female hemophiliac and a male, then, then everybody's, everybody's screwed. But, um, <laughs> uh, but it's pretty rare, right? It's, it's mostly the males, yeah. If she died, what if she, if she died during childbirth, yeah, I mean that's true. That's one of the. Any time somebody's bleeding, that's that's high cause for or high concern for death, right? Because if you're bleeding and you're failing to, um, most females don't survive hemophilia. Um, number one, because of menstruation cycles, you know, females are uh, are menstruating and bleeding a lot once a month, and so there's lots of opportunities to bleed out, right? Um, so that's one of the reasons why females don't usually hang around as hemophiliacs. But then also childbirth is another time where 
it's gonna, that's going to be really traumatic. So I don't know. May, maybe, maybe there are hemophiliacs that we're able to care for better now because we've got clotting factors and we can help. Um, but traditionally, he, female hemophiliacs were very rare. Yeah. So. Tamara, do you have something to add? Yeah. Uh -huh. She refused to because she's Christian. She's like, well, God put it there. I'm going to see it through. And yeah. she had the doctors going crazy the day she delivered, and the baby's fine. Oh, and she's fine. Oh, excellent. Yeah, wonderful. Modern medicine is making that happen. <laughs> it's pr probably traditionally that wouldn't have happened. Uh, there are also Y linked traits, they're pretty rare. <laughs> And they're pretty horrific, too. Um, um, there's very few uh, proteins that are coded for on the Y chromosome. Uh, and so there's very few traits that are actually dictated by proteins on the Y chromosome. Uh, this is the hairy ear trait. Um, it's a, a mutation in, in, uh, in a regulatory gene on the Y chromosome. that So they fail to regulate the hair production on the ears for whatever reason. Um, Y-linked traits obviously are only going to be inherited father to son, right? X-linked traits, it's usually what your mom contributed is what determines what the males show. So male pattern baldness is one of the X-linked. Um, male pattern baldness is, is an X-linked trait. So it's, if you want to know if you're going to have male pattern baldness, uh, you have to look at your mother's father or your mother's mother's father, right, to determine who is carrying the bad X chromosome, right? Um, with Y-linked, it's obvious. If your dad's got this condition and you're a son, you're going to have it too, right? So uh, only inherited father to th son. All right. We'll just introduce sex determination because we only had a couple of minutes left, but we'll pick up this next time. So those are sex-linked traits, right? Traits that tend to go with one or the other sex. Sex determination is how do you become male or female to begin with, OK? And there's actually two mechanisms. The traditional mechanism we usually think of is chromosomal mechanisms. And we're kind of you know, uh, ethnocentric or humanocentric. We usually think of humans, right? So humans uh, use chromosomal determination. That is, the inheritance of a chromosome is what determines whether you're male or female. Now, there's a couple of flavors of this, actually. In, in humans, it's whether you inherit an X. Right? The presence of the X, I, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. The presence of the Y. Right? If you have a Y, you will develop male traits. If you don't have a Y, you will not develop male traits. So default is to female. If you have an X, if you have a Y, <laughs> You will, you will go from the default female and start developing like a male. There are reciprocals of this as well. So in humans, it's the heterogametic that makes you a male. There are certain species that the homogametic is what makes you male, and the females have the two different chromosomes. Okay, We'll talk about these, but we should just say, to begin with, chromosomal mechanisms, say you inherit a chromosome, and on that contains genes that turn on the, the male development developmental pattern. Okay. The second mechanism is environmental. There are some organisms that don't have male and female chromosomes. Males and females have identical chromosomes. Everyone is homogametic. But it's the environment that you're raised in that determines whether or not you become male or female. So it could be temperature. If the embryo is incubated at a high temperature, it might become male. If it's incubated at a lower temperature, it becomes female. Or it could be chemicals, or certain other chemicals, or other factors that are in the environment. Um, nutrition levels are important in some insects. So they like starve the males and feed the females. And so it's actually uh, nutrients that determine whether or not you develop as a male or as a female. But this means that every, every organism in the population has the inherent ability to either be male or female and you can determine what happens by environment. So if you want to shift proportions, you can. So yeah. So uh, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but when, you, when you're determined male or female, and then you go, 
you do not you don't start the process of development before that decision is made. So could you get a, a Y, so a male determination, but then accidentally be hormone washed with female? Uh, usually the usually it's not a mix of two, but I see where you're going. Like um, if you are male. In humans, the reason you're male is because the X chromosome is producing some genes that turn on male hormones. And it's the male hormones that influence how, how the body develops, right? So if you could affect it at the hormone level, you know, somehow inhibit the testosterone and saturate that embryo with estrogen, you can override the chromosomal determination, right? It would, it would still appear male? No, it would appear female then, yeah. Because you're, you're overriding the downstream effects, right? The, the underlying cause is the chromosomes, but the chromosomes are you know, producing genes that produce the hormones. Well, no matter what the genes are, if you manipulate the hormone levels, you can, you can change things. Uh, you could be, well, what, the question is, are you female then? <laughs> right? You would have female traits and female external, but, this di and this brings up a fundamental kind of philosophical question. Now, is it chromosomes that make you male or female, or is it your, your phenotype that makes you male or female? It's, we kind of get into a gray area, but we'll talk about this next time. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.